You are too kind, Hunter. Thank you so much for having me today. And more importantly, thank you, LaFawn, for being here. I am so excited to be moderating this conversation and dive in not only into your background and your journey, but of course, what you see for the future of hiring, trends, all of that good stuff that Hunter just mentioned. I'm, I'm feeling super inspired already. So why don't we kick off by giving the audience a little more insight into who you are, your role at Indeed, and your personal identity? Sure. Well, first of all, Lauren, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back at uh, speaking with Power to Fly. Uh, my name is LaFawn Davis, Senior Vice President of Environmental, Social, and Governance at Indeed. Uh, what that means is that I lead teams around, of course, environmental sustainability, AI ethics, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging plus. We put the plus on there, kind of like the LGBTQ plus community, uh, social impact pro uh, products and programs as well. And so we have some pretty amazing goals toward the year 2030. Uh, and that is to, of course, be net zero. We're already carbon neutral as a company. So we will keep doing that year over year, but we're going for net zero in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we also wanna help 30 million job seekers facing barriers get hired by the year 2030. And we also wanna shorten the duration of job search by 50%, making it faster for people to get a job so that they can stay above the poverty line. And then lastly, one of our big goals is also to make sure that our workforce reflects the world around us. So we wanna have 50% women globally at all levels. And then we also want to have 30% underrepresented ethnic minorities in the U.S. So those are our, our really big goals for ESG at Indeed. And it's a little different than some other um, ESG strategies. Normally, the S focuses within a company. That is a social goal. So normally, it, it's the workforce. But our S is for society. So we're focused on the world around us uh, for our social goals. Um, I've been at Indeed for mm, almost four years. In a few days, it'll be four years. Um, and it's been a phenomenal journey at Indeed. Now, personally, um, I am Black. I am queer. Uh, I'm a woman. I am uh, a mother of an adult son. Um, I'm of a mature age and I'm fabulous. So those are how I personally identify. Um, I'm married to a wonderful woman named Cherie Sprite. We got married during the pandemic. Uh, I have two amazing little dogs. So I have a miniature schnauzer who is eight years old and his name is Odin Fettywop because he has one eye and uh, also have a 12 year old cockapoo named Romeo Belafonte because he's a ladies man. So uh, that's kind of my personal story. And I've been doing work um, mostly around uh, DEI and, and social impact for almost 20 years. I've worked at a few companies, uh, mostly tech companies like Google, Yahoo, PayPal, Twilio, and now Indeed. Um, and I'm also on the advisory board for Power to Fly, um, along with being on the advisory board for Lesbians Who Tech. And I am a, um, a board member of the World Wellbeing Movement, which is about making sure that well-being is at the center of policy and decision making. I think I think I covered most of the things. <laughs> I think you covered everything and more. It's amazing. And it's no surprise that your background is just incredibly diverse and as well as your identity. And I know how much that plays a role in your success as a professional as well. So I'd love to like dive in a little bit more to how you take your identity as a black queer woman into that life at Indeed. And I know you mentioned a few things, but I, I can imagine that this is, is just very core to your success and obviously your role. Absolutely. Um, well, one, I'm the first queer black woman in the C-suite at Indeed. Uh, and with that comes, you know, um, either code switching because I have to be aware of the audience around me 
for being able to be my authentic self. And I was just saying this the other day, I think at Indeed, I've been more myself than anywhere I've ever worked. Um, not bashing the other places I've worked. I just feel maybe it's this point of life that I'm, that I'm in. I, I, I care less <laughs> about how people perceive me, or maybe it's just the environment um, and pushing to be more authentic so that others can also be themselves. Um, I think I bring my personal identity into every room that I'm in, every single room that I'm in. I have a perspective that not everyone around me has. And so when I'm in a room with my peers, I know that I am showing up with that lens in mind, right? And in a way that they they can't, not because they don't want to, but because it's not their lived experience. Uh, when I am surrounded by people who also identify similarly, I mean, it is it is uh, very free. <laughs> I've been on a one-on-one -on -one with one of my vice presidents, like, hold on, I'm trying to fix my lash. Um, or <laughs> I have just, you know, said certain things that I know most people wouldn't get, but because they come from the same culture I come from, I can just say those things. And it really is beautiful. You notice that you're when you have to kind of contain who you are, you'll notice that your body restricts. You might you might feel that like your chest tightens a little bit, or maybe at the end of the day of just holding in who you are, you're tired and exhausted, right? Not because you've worked super hard at work, but because you've worked really hard personally holding who you are. And so it's really beautiful to just show up as, as me and know that the work that I do is so core and fundamental to who I am that it flows that way. I don't have to change who I am in order to do the work that I love. It's quite the opposite. Um, I think ESG has allowed me to fight for everyone. And that's what's important to me. That no one is a binary identity, right? No one is just one thing. We all have intersectional layers, whether we recognize them or not. And I think that lens allows me to fight for everyone. It allows me to understand and step into other people's points of view. It allows me to also have empathy for others' lived experiences that I don't have because of who I am. Um, and I think that that's a beautiful thing. It's so powerful too. Uh, and I want to dive in a little bit more to that evolution because I'm sure the way that you feel today is not the way that you felt when you got your first job or you know, when you not. first stepped into the <laughs> corporate world. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about that DEIB evolution and you know yeah. how you felt when you first joined to now and the changes that you're seeing and the growth um, in organizations across the board? Yeah, I, oh, so not my first job. My first job was, I was actually 14 years old. Um, <laughs> but but um, I would say when I first really got into the workforce as an adult and was working, um, not to date myself, but I started doing the dot-com bubble and burst, uh, the first one. And uh, I remember working at a job where uh, I wore braids to work and the uh, HR business partner was like, oh, your, your hair is, it's, it's so uh, urban. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> um, I wasn't quite sure how to take that. And I was younger, so I really didn't, didn't understand language, right? You're, I was taught to, um, you have to work twice as hard to go half as far, um, to only make sure that people knew so much about you and to, to not stick out, right? Um, and so I wasn't sure how to combat that at the time. It just, it just felt really crappy. Um, I remember being at a company I won't mention, but at the time there wasn't a baby boom at the company. Um, everyone was was pretty young. No one had kids except for me. I was a single mom at a pretty young age. And uh, on my review, I uh, part of my feedback from my manager was that I wasn't dedicated to my team because I couldn't go out to all the 
happy hours and the, you know, after hours things, I wasn't dedicated to my team, which actually affected my rating, which affected my bonus. So that was my pay, my compensation. Again, not having the language to understand what that really meant or how to fight, um, how to fight something like that. Right. And so that's kind of the space where diversity just wasn't a thing, <laughs> it, at least in tech. It, it it has been in other industries for a while, but definitely not in tech. And it wasn't until I got into the first diversity team at Google that I even had some of the experience or the language around the work that needed to happen. And I think the diversity part was really where companies focused um, most companies, at least at that time, was just throwing money at diversity, right? It, at counting heads and trying to make sure that the numbers change. Uh, kind of in came inclusion. Uh, I think initially that was because um, diversity seemed almost like a dirty word. And there was a power dynamic there, right? People that are in majority those that are not marginalized or vulnerable, it feels like an attack when you're trying to create a space that's equitable for everyone. Um, power doesn't give up power willingly. So I think inclusion first came into the industry to make it palatable for other people to understand why this work is important. However, the true meaning about inclusion is so that voices are heard. It's so that people have a seat at the table um, it's not so that it's easier than diversity. Uh, then belonging was the evolution when I got to Indeed. And that was really more around psychological safety and the fact that regardless of where people come from, who they are, what they do, everyone should feel like they belong. Everyone should feel like they belong. It's a little different than inclusion because there may be spaces where your voice is not heard or not needed or not at the table, but you should still feel like you belong there. Um, and that one, I have to tell you, Lauren, was easy for people to understand globally. As we all know, don't want to preach to the choir, but as we all know, diversity means something different in every country. What an uh, underrepresented you know, minority means is very different by country, by industry. So belonging was this space where we could talk about psychological safety and the fact that no one should have fear of negative consequences. Everyone should feel like they could push against the status quo or offer new ideas or be really innovative as a as as a company, right? It's it's a it's a team dynamic. It's a little different than trust. You know, Lauren, I trust that you're going to ask me questions aligned to kind of what you briefed me on before. That's trust. But psychological safety is the belief that everyone who's listening to this call is going to give me the benefit of the doubt um, and, and not react negatively to something that I say or think that I have ill intent. So that was our, our journey, bringing it into Indeed was belonging. And we just added equity into it with the plus because there's always so much work to be done. There, there's not a linear space where okay, we've got this diversity thing down. All right, we've got inclusion. We figured that out. Now let's focus on something else. This, this space is so vast and there's always going to be people to fight for. There's always going to be people who feel marginalized. And so equity was how we approach the work, but we didn't put it in the name. Uh, equity is different than equality, right? Equality is everybody's on the same playing field, but e equity is recognizing that we all didn't start from the same place. And that's a really important aspect of doing the work, because if you just focus on equality, you're never going to get there. That's a utopian state that I hope we get to one day. <laughs> but for now, it's really important that we have equity and that we're making sure that fairness is a part of everything that we do at work. It'd be great if we did it in our lives too, but at work, that you know, processes, programs, opportunities, all of those things are equitable. Otherwise, equality is always going to be some dream. 
What a, I, I'm blown away and I could listen to you talk about this forever. I mean, another 45 minutes at least, but thank you for sharing your story and your perspective. And I think that's actually a really good segue into talking about change and what comes next, because as you know, and as you kind of spoke about, you know, Indeed's transition into adding all of these new verticals of inclusion, um, there's been a lot going on in the world. And between a recent wave of layoffs, a shift in employee priorities with the pandemic, um, and now the rise of AI, I just got off a really crazy webinar. I'm like over rethinking all my AI, uh, AI thoughts, but it seems like the workplace is really at a crossroads. And mm. I mean, there's no saying what comes next. I'm, I'm curious though, LaFon, what, what do you think comes next? Well, there are a lot of things going on always, <laughs> always. And I think what we've learned from the pandemic was that, um, you know, the job market work, the way we work, that hasn't really been reevaluated since the industrial revolution, right? You, you have this battle of work from home or get back in the office or hybrid or, um, you know, how people show up to work, how they get work done, um, the type of work that's important. Um, DEI as well as ESG is being used as a, a political strategy right now um, to be anti-woke and things like that. Uh, there's so much going on, <laughs> right? Globally, there's things happening everywhere. And I think what we learned during the pandemic was that uh, we have to take care of the people who are working. We have to take care of employees and we can't really do the whole, uh, there's like separation of church and state or separation of work and life, um, that your personal life stays out. And we're, we're gonna be mission focused and not focus on social issues. These are whole humans. These are whole humans who are showing up with all of the things that they're carrying from the life outside of the corporate walls. And so understanding how to take care of the humans has been a really big aspect of what we focused on as part of the DEIB plus journey. We do things like we have compassion circles when something blows up in the world, <laughs> uh, healing hours, uh, safe spaces. Uh, sometimes we bring in psychologists, psychiatrists, trauma experts, because that's what this is. <laughs> we are experiencing trauma on a daily basis. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to show up to work and just say, I can't, I can't today, today, or this is what happened. And this is so heavy for me that I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to, to do the work that I'd like to do and having other team members step up and say, what can I take for you? What can I do for you? If it's nothing else, but just listen. Right? Even if they don't feel that way, it could be something that, say, something happens to the Black community or something, another law passes that's attack, attacking our, our trans community or the children, and it's too much. And other people who might not feel as emotional about it or it doesn't hit them in the same way can still be empathetic and say, I got you. Right? That, that was the big lesson learned, I think, during the pandemic and even into now, because it's not like things have stopped since COVID supposedly isn't a pandemic, even though it's still around. Um, <laughs> I think um, the humanity, the empathy, it, it can no longer just be, well, this is about our business strategy and making money. Because if the people around you are not okay, if the people who are doing the work are not whole, then your business is going to suffer. Right? I think we're out of the space of having to make the business case for diversity. I would normally use my quotation fingers. Um, and we're now in the space of just talking about humanity and what does it mean? And talking about things like privilege, which used to be a no-no in the workplace and talking about things like supremacy and other issues like that. That used to be so taboo. But now I feel like in the right environments, I totally get not everywhere is like this, but in the right environments, I feel like the conversations are so much more progressive um, that people look at, that that leaders look at employees as humans at work 
versus just employees who are supposed to do a job. I think that part is beautiful, even though the world around us is a dumpster fire. <laughs> to say the least, right? <laughs> oh. Well, I, I want to use the um, example of layoffs because it's probably the yeah. easiest one to point to, um, yeah. and maybe not layoffs specifically, but let's just say like the economy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we're seeing, you know, a stagnancy in revenue for many companies, if not decreases. And during these like very challenging times for organizations, mm -hmm. I, I can imagine it's easy to lose sight of diversity goals of, you know, making strides towards inclusivity, but why should companies not forget about DEIB plans and how do they ensure that these initiatives are still top of mind, that they are continuing to practice inclusive hiring and support their employees in all the ways that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you talked about all the nuances when tragedy strikes, because to your point, it feels like it's happening every single day. Mm -hmm. And that's so important for companies to maintain and frankly, retain these employees during these challenging times. So I'd love to hear your perspective there. Sure. Well, Lauren, we told we told people bring your whole self to work, and that was a lie. <laughs> that was that was a lie, because no company is prepared for that. So I don't even say that now. I said bring your best self, bring your authentic self. <laughs> no, nobody's ready. Y'all don't want to see all of this, right? So um, we <laughs> we're 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 at a a space right now. It's it's almost like you know if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it, right? In times of economic uncertainty or challenges, uh, this always happens. This always happens. The good stuff is what goes away when a company is really thinking about, oh my God, goodness, what, what do we got to do for revenue? What do we have to do to make sure our profits stay high? Cut all the good things. <laughs> and, and, and so this is cyclical. If you, if you look at the recessions, if you look at um, any time in industry, like the dot-com bubble and burst, anytime there's mass layoffs, which was really hitting the tech industry this time, uh, that always happens. And, and I will say that that happens when a company is not very serious about it, right? I, I, I have done this work for a long time and there's definitely been companies who are just interested in a figurehead uh, they're just interested in checking the box so they can say they have someone who's looking over diversity uh, when really that's just, it's just performative. That's all that it is. It's performative. And so it's very easy for those companies to ramp down diversity or to say, nope, we're not going to do this anymore because it wasn't important in the first place. Uh, companies where it is important, it was always true. They're still going. I'm still going. <laughs> we're still going. Uh, the work doesn't stop because there's economic uncertainty, because the job market is a little different than it was before. It's not necessarily a free-for-all, but if you look at the tech layoffs that happened, I would say round one and two, the majority of those workers found new jobs quickly, <laughs> found new jobs. There are companies that are still hiring. I think where we are right now, though, is that both consumers and job seekers are looking to work for companies that match their values. And I don't mean that in the like, I don't mean that in the performative way. I, I mean, really are looking for companies that match their values. They will not buy your products or services. They will find a company that gives the same thing you do, could even be a higher price point, but it's a company that they can respect. They won't apply for your company if your values don't match theirs. And so, if you are a company who is performative in nature and who said all the things, especially during 2020, we stand in solidarity with all of the insert community there uh, and you're doing nothing. You are absolutely doing nothing. Employees know it. Job seekers can see it. And, and people are also calling companies out. They're saying, hey, look at your leadership team. <laughs> You claim to care about diversity, but look at your leadership team, right? And, and people did that to Indeed as well during 2020. This is before I joined the leadership team. And the companies that were honest, like, yep, you're right. 
we, we have to do something about it and then did, right? Actually do and take action. I think what we're seeing is normal. It's unfortunate, but it's normal. We know that in this space, there are people who actually don't care. There are people who actually don't want the power dynamic to change at all, who get very uncomfortable with, with examining the privilege that they hold. There are also some people who are like, yeah, I'm going to fight the good fight, and I elbow my way to the table, and then they close ranks and don't make space for anyone else. This is this is normal, right? And what you're seeing is a lot of rhetoric. So you're seeing a lot of like anti-ESG, anti-woke, anti-diversity, but that's just because it's in our face all the time. Companies have always been doing this. And so it behooves us to keep going. It behooves us to call those companies out. You said that you were gonna do these things. What's your progress? How are you doing on it? Did you divest in it? Did you just say it? So you're a liar is what you're saying, right? It's, it's, we have to keep pushing because this fight, unfortunately, doesn't stop. And it doesn't stop just because a company puts a rainbow logo, right? For the month of June, it, it doesn't stop because a company is like, yes, we have, uh, we're carbon neutral because carbon neutral is great. But what it means is you're just investing in good projects to offset your bad stuff. It's still a good thing to do, right? But it can't stop there. It can't stop there. Um, and so I think that that's, that's, that's our, it's, it's not our job in the way that we have to be the ones to keep doing all of this. The system has to change from within. And if we don't hold the power, then we have to continue to push those that do. So for me, this is just like, almost like Groundhog's Day, when there was a recession before and when there was a bubble before. Um, and it just now, I think I have the language and um, a lot more fearless to be able to have the direct conversations with the right language, with leaders who have the power to change. If I'm picking out any undertones of what you're saying, it really is that we hold the power in a lot of this change, which is really motivating and promising when we think about how we maybe as individual contributors are not necessarily high level leadership, the impact that we can make on organizations. I think that's very, um, I guess, motivating in a way. Is that, could you agree? Absolutely. It, it's the, it's not going to change otherwise. Yeah. Right. It, it isn't. It, it's people get very comfortable uh, with with a power structure. And so if we're not pushing it, if we're not and I'm not talking about be the change you want to see, like I, 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 I get it. That's in the mantra. and It's great for meditation. Um, however, <laughs> I. I think we should blow shit up. Sorry, I don't mean to cuss, but I think we should. We should blow shit up <laughs> and not not focus on well. Let, let let's show people how to be more empathetic and and show no, no that organic diversity doesn't work. That's not a thing. It's not a thing because we got to where we are organically by just by just being in the environment and the systems that were already built, but they weren't built for us. They were built to maintain power. So we got to cause a ruckus. <laughs> That's the only way change is going to happen. <laughs> I love it. I'm ready to cause a ruckus with you. <laughs> uh, let's pivot a little bit and talk specifically about hiring in 2023. And you mentioned this, that companies are still hiring. We are hosting a job fair tomorrow with 18 companies actively looking to hire um, a wide array of talent. But uh, specifically, what do you think about using college degrees in job requirements? Oh, Lauren, listen, uh, there are some places where college degree is important, right? I want I want my doctor to 
to have, you know, gotten a degree, several of them, if they can. Um, however, for the vast majority of jobs, college degree is used as a proxy and not a good proxy. Um, and so I like to share, I, I'm a senior vice president at a, a really great company and I don't have a college degree. Um, and can you imagine, Lauren, can you imagine if indeed have been like, well, you don't have a college degree, so we're not going to hire you. We would have messed out on all of this amazingness, right? Like that's ridiculous. But I used to be really, um, I was ashamed of not having a college degree before because it absolutely was a barrier to entry. When, when I was starting off my career and the bubble burst, I went from making $90,000 a year to eleven seventy five dollars an hour. I could not get a job in the field. I was in operations and I'm really good at it, but none of that mattered because I didn't have a college degree. And so no one would hire me to do that type of job. And it really gave me a, a bit of a complex, right? Like I was like, uh, I, I attended college. I did. Uh, so I'd find a way to say, you know, like I, I would put the college on my resume and just hope they didn't ask me if I graduated. Um, and that really helped set me up for the, the role that I'm in now because job seekers face barriers to entry. College degree is one of them. And it impacts Black and Brown people in the U.S. more than anything. And so as a company, you're, you are decreasing your pipeline of amazing talent if you're using college degree as a proxy. Again, there's some jobs, it matters. But for the vast majority, it doesn't. And as we've removed college degree requirements from our own job descriptions, we see an uptick in people applying. Because you have no idea how many people look at your job descriptions and go, oh, nope, that's a requirement. And so I can't apply. It, it changes so many things when you really make sure that what you're asking for is around the skills that you need for the role, right? So skills-based hiring is where we see the future of work. It's not about the company name. It's not about the school you went to. It's about the skill set that you have. And as a job seeker, translating the skill set in a way that employers can recognize and having employers create job descriptions that focus on the skills, not on the where and the when you worked or went to school. We also see uh, things like criminal records being a, a huge barrier to entry. And the United States, it's the most incarcerated country in the world. Your criminal record can start in middle school. There's misdemeanors, felonies, there's all sorts of things, which again, impact people of color, LGBTQ+, like all of the dimensions, much more than the majority population in this country. And it is the only barrier where it is legal to discriminate. I can legally say you have a criminal record. I don't have to hire you and tell you to your face. It's legal to discriminate for that one, unfortunately. And so we have a lot of work to remove the process of looking at criminal record as well and encouraging uh, companies who kind of ban the box where they don't ask about that stuff that... Um, they uh, label themselves as a fair chance employer. So that way, people who do have a criminal record understand what companies want to hire them the most, right? Go where you're wanted. And so we do see an increase in pipeline there as well when companies take, um, take that chance. We also see barriers to entry like for our military veterans, right? The translatable skills that they have, like amazing skills has to be translated into a way that an employer can understand. There are people with disabilities and accessibility is a barrier to entry. If a company doesn't understand how to provide reasonable accommodations, there are so many barriers to entry and so many things used as a proxy. Like Lauren, I could look at your resume and say, oh, you've worked here, here, and here. So you must be able to do this job. Where this other person worked over here and I don't know them. So I'm gonna go with Lauren, I mean, Lauren, you're amazing, but I'm gonna go with Lauren because she worked at these companies. That's ridiculous. That doesn't mean that 
one candidate is able to do the job better than the other because of where they worked or where they went to school. And so at Indeed, we're trying to remove the barriers into the job market. And there's, I'm sure, many, many more barriers that we were we will explore and understand and figure out how to remove as well. But that's what the future looks like. If the future of work is inclusive, if the future of work is queer, the future of work is Black, the future of work is female, all of those things, then we have to not only remove the barriers, but also focus on the bias that is part of the hiring process. Bias is inherently human. And I know you, like AI is blown up and it's everywhere. And um, people are, you know, there's like this frenzy about it. But I think we do ourselves a disservice by calling it artificial intelligence because AI is trained on human behavior. It's human behavior, right? So the, the human part of bias will always be there. And to remove that kind of intersection between bias and barriers, we have to focus on what are the human processes of this system that we can change so that more people can enter the job market that might be kept out because of sometimes things they can't even control. Well, I was going to say, Lafon, you might not have hired me because my degree was actually in genetics. So talk about a marketer, totally science. Totally <laughs> um, would. Yeah. So I, I'm just like you, like a very odd background or non-traditional background um, with a non-linear career path. So I'm laughing uh, at that analogy. Very funny. But I have two really great audience questions that actually talk about what you exactly said. And the mm -hmm. first question is, um, what are the steps that Indeed has taken to uh, address unconscious bias in the hiring process? And then the second question is about AI. So we'll start with the unconscious bias one, since you talked about that first. Absolutely. So Again, um, this is because, again, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, unconscious bias was the thing, right? And it was to check the box. Everybody get trained on unconscious bias. So sure, we have unconscious bias modules. Everyone can go through them. But um, the way to remove bias, reduce bias as much as possible, there's no way to remove it 100%, is to focus on the system. So we focus on how we hire. Right. And if we focus on skills based hiring, then we're getting more people in the door. We also have what we call IIR, which is the inclusive interview rule. Some people may know it as like a version of the Rooney rule, uh, which is to it's not about who you hire, but it is to make sure that your pipeline is diverse and you cannot make a hiring decision until it is. And that's a kind of forcing function. And we did that for our um, director and above roles. When you change the system, then it's not about the unconscious bias because there is conscious bias too. <laughs> I've, you know, uh, one of my team members did a, um, a shadow session to listen to some of our clients. And there was a, a small to medium business who said out loud, Oh, uh, well, I don't want to hire a woman for this role. They're too expensive. Because they may go out on maternity leave. You may have to do all the things. I was like, wow, they said it out loud. <laughs> which is great, which is great because it, it's better to know where someone is coming from rather than have someone do it in the background anyway, right? Take away opportunities for women anyway. Um, so for us, we have focused on removing college degree requirements where it makes sense. We have focused on um, becoming a fair chance employer. Uh, we are looking at how bias shows up in the hiring process, whether it is in, re in, in the resume screening or whether it is with the hiring manager in the interview process. We are um, trying to shore up how we interview because, you know, if we're interviewing differently rather than uh, evidence-based or um, behavioral-based, uh, then that actually leads to a lot more bias as well. So it's it's focusing on the hiring process, not how do we make people less bias, because they will always be. It's great if someone can recognize their bias, but the thing about unconscious bias, again, uh, quotation fingers, is you have to build a system to disrupt decision-making in the moment. 
in the moment. So when we have a process and say leaders have to decide, you know, who's getting rewarded or who's getting an opportunity, um, we have to look at decision making in the moment. When we look at our hiring process in arrears, meaning how do we do last quarter? That never works because you go, oh, well, darn, we should do something different next time. <laughs> but you've already done it, right? In the moment when you can say, okay, this decision that I'm making, how is it impacting the makeup of my team? How is it impacting the makeup of our workforce? So that's how we're looking at the hiring process. Each part of the funnel is a decision, right? And that is where bias has to be disrupted. It is not so much in the moment of everyone just take unconscious bias training and then you'll be cured. <laughs> it is looking at every decision that you make and making sure that you are putting a lens of, is this actually going to impact people differently? We at Indeed, we always say talent is universal and opportunity is not, right? That is the understanding that Talent is everywhere, no matter what people look like, no matter their demographic makeup, it is everywhere. What is missing is the opportunity, and that is where the bias comes in. I love that. I love that saying. I hope everyone wrote that down. If not, you can watch the recording and jot it down as inspiration for your management team. Uh, and I hope that answered your question, whoever asked that. Let's talk a little bit then about AI and what role you believe that technology and AI can play in promoting inclusivity and diversity within the workplace and the hiring process specifically. Yeah, so AI, specifically for us, AI ethics is making sure that our products are actually fair, right? That it is creating uh, an environment through our products and with our employers who are hiring that everyone has a fair shot. Um, and I think that that's important because intentionally, unintentionally, again, products are built by humans, humans with inherent bias. So we want to make sure that our that our products are not adding to that for uh, job seekers and employers. The other aspect is just AI in general. And AI in general is like, it's it's going nuts right now, <laughs> right? Chat, I call it chat PT Cruiser, but that is everywhere. Um, you know, the the <laughs> the deep fake stuff kind of freaks me out, right? You could, Lauren, if you were in the deep fake stuff, you could change everything I'm saying right now with my image and my voice, right? That's scary. When we start to look at things like identity theft and all that, there, uh, AI can get real dark real fast, but there's also a lot of beauty to it because if we build products correctly, right? And using AI, AI learns human behavior. So if we're trying to remove bias from the process, AI can learn that and help easily create a more inclusive pipeline, a more inclusive hiring process, right? That, that's the goodness of AI. And it goes really fast. I don't know if you've used chat PT Cruiser, but if you ask, you can ask it anything, <laughs> absolutely anything. I know some people are getting in trouble in school because they're writing whole papers using it. <laughs> But again, that, that's the darker side of things. The goodness of it is how quickly things can be created, how much innovation there can be. Uh, I, I want to lean on the good part and keep an eye out on the, on, the, on, the, on the dark part. Like any technology, we have to have a level of integrity with it, right? Because if we don't take care of AI, specifically in the hiring process, we know that a job is more than a paycheck, right? It, it is someone's livelihood. It, it, it gives them the ability to take care of themselves and their family. It, it is uh, economic stability and mobility. So AI in this space has to be used with care because we are dealing with real people. We're not just dealing with technology. 
I think you mentioned it at the beginning, but like the humans and the people, that's something that, you know, what, regardless of what you're using AI for that human touch can never be replaced. And I was saying, I I was just on a webinar before this and after every prompt, every example, the, uh, moderator gave, he said, okay, but this is how it needs to be edited by a human. So I know we like talk a lot at Power to Fly about, you know, the impacts of AI and ChatGPT and how it's going to make our lives so easy. But I, I mean, I do believe that there is still so much more to our human identities that we're not, it's it, a no artificial intelligence is ever going to get that uh, detailed into the nuances of human behavior and hum- human mind, yeah, mindset even. So yeah, there's a humanity, there's yeah. a humanity, right? And so yeah. you, could, you could use it and create a job description, which, which is great, create a job description, but you're going to want to look at it and make sure it's representative of what you need. You want to make sure that you're giving people an idea of what the job really is. And, and that takes a human. You can't remove humans from the hiring process. There's lots of things that you can probably remove humans from. And automation is, when automation comes in at any time in history, it displaces sometimes industries, it displaces jobs, but then new jobs are always created right? They're always created. And the gap there is for the people that were displaced to be able to learn new skill sets or translate the skills that they have into whatever new industry has been created because of the automation. AI is no different. I just heard a job, a prompt engineer, and I thought that was pretty wild. (laughs) I don't know if that's going to be a real thing, but what a, what a time. Uh, But let's talk actually about that, about the obsolete processes, about the hiring requirements that are no longer necessary. And I know you mentioned a few and how to mitigate some of the bias and boxes that we should uncheck for um, other underrepresented groups. But um, are there any others that you see as being obsolete or becoming obsolete, or maybe there are hiring managers listening to this call right now, and you could give them, you know, a few tips of advice to make that process a little more inclusive. So besides making sure that you are removing the barriers that are unnecessary for the jobs that you want, you want to make sure your job description, your job description is written in a a way that uses inclusive language. Um, you don't ask, you need to ask for somebody to be like a warrior ninja or, <laughs> or use kind of like gendered language. Um, you know, being able to talk about what the role really does entail, what you're looking for, um, and, and being truthful about what your environment is like. That That is where inclusion and belonging come in. You can focus on hiring a different workforce all you want, but if you do not have an environment in which they can thrive, they will leave. And I believe that when you ask for marginalized communities to come into your organization and you have an organization in which they will not be able to be successful, I believe that you are causing further harm. That's just my, my view. And so really focusing on not only who we want to hire, what kind of job it is, but what kind of environment and team do we have at this company? How can we make it a place where people have psychological safety, where if they're the only, insert demographic here, (laughs) that they don't feel tokenized and they don't feel like uh, we just hired them because of what they look like, not because of what they can do. Um, I think you have to be open to non-traditional backgrounds like myself and Lawrence. (laughs) If you're not, you are missing out on some incredible people. And that, that kind of, um, evaluation and, and moving towards that is hard. It's hard, especially when you like work for a company who is like, we're only going to hire from the top 10 colleges. I'm like, what kind of party is this? <laughs> Right? Like that doesn't make any sense. Sure, they're smart, but the top 10% at any college and university is going to be amazing, most likely. So why limit yourself to a small portion of a talent pipeline? 
the best thing that you can do to open it up and make sure you're seeing all the best talent is to make sure that you have a process that is welcoming and an environment that is welcoming. Yes, you still need certain skills. Everybody can't do everything or they might not know how to do it, but you can do that in a way that shows that you value the differences. You value non-traditional backgrounds just as much as you value the traditional backgrounds. Um, you can stand on your word. So when you say you care about your employees, you show them that you do. I think that's, it, it's it's a shift. It's a shift. It's it's not just saying we're going to remove this one bullet from the job description and we'll be good to go. It really is a systemic change, and, but it's a change that is totally possible. It is a change that is attainable, but it has to be intentional. Intentionality, so, so, so important. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's let's talk a little bit about DEIB trends for 2023. Maybe not just hiring, but with, across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you're observing and you expect to continue growing throughout the rest of this year and maybe even 2024? Oh, we're talking about good trends, right? Okay. Good trends, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for the companies that are actually invested, um, I see the trends moving in the direction of, again, not just focusing on um, counting heads because that just never works. The good trends are really around the environment, right? The inclusion, the belonging. I see many more companies who are actually invested who are focusing on the equity work. Um, equity is necessary. Because again, lots of historical barriers in place. Uh, we're not all starting from the same place. So, you know, taking stuff apart, dismantling certain processes that have been put into place and building it new with equity in mind. I, I do see that happening for the companies that are really invested. It's necessary. In order to advance the work, you have to get really deep into the systems that have been created over whatever time. If you're a startup, even better, right? Because you, you haven't had the system that long and you can make a change. If you've been around a long time, it may take some time to kind of steer the ship in a different direction, but it's possible. And I do see that. I see amazing people doing amazing work, caring about this space in a different way than I think what I've seen in the past. Because again, it was about counting heads. Right. And inclusion is about making sure that the voices are heard. Belonging should feel like every part of your being feels like you should be there. Right. And so it's it's I'm inspired by the the energy that I see right now. I am also hopeful. And I'm also an optimist. So maybe that's why. But I'm I'm hopeful that the companies are actually saying this is not okay, right? It was okay in the past. We didn't do anything about it in the past, but now we're in a space where we actually do want a workforce that represents the world around us. And we do want to make sure that we have an environment in which people can thrive. I see it happening. It might not be happening everywhere, but I see it happening. And that gives me hope that we'll see more of it in the future. And let's take that question even broader. What are, or what do you see as being the future of work? So holistically speaking, I know everyone is saying this is such a pivotal time and talking about returning to office or hybrid. I, I, there have been so many shifts, AI, but what do you think is the future? What is like the big change that we can expect? I think the future of work is skills-based hiring. I do. Um, it has not been done in a way that I think it it needs to and will be happening in the future. That is the only way that the workforce is going to look differently. It's the only way because it has to be around the skills that you have. If we just focus on demographics solely, right, just what people look like, just what their identities are, we're going to stay in a similar place than we are now. That has to be combined with just 
opening up talent pipelines for just a, a plethora of people and different backgrounds and experiences and all of the things that diversity actually is. Um, I think the future of work is inclusive. I think the future of work is, is you know, answer blank here, <laughs> right? Because the workforce can't stay what it's been. There's no way to continue to be innovative and have new companies and have new focuses and new products and services if we stay how we are. And so I think the future of work is inclusive. The future of work is going to be around the skills that you have to bring to a company and a job and not just your experience or your title or your school. Um, and that's exciting to me, not just because that's you know, who I am, but the the type of people I'm going to be able to work with, I'm really excited about because I think that's going to bring something different to the industries that we have in place right now. AI is going to turn everything on its head. Again, there's a scary place that that can go, but I am going to stay on the hopeful side um, because I think there's there's amazing innovations that can come out of it. And so with skills-based hiring, that will help with the automation, AI is part of automation, that's going to help with the automation that will be displacing likely whole industries, right? There still needs to be a place for the employees to be able to go when they are displaced from AI. So if we focus on skills-based hiring, I think that's going to create a different future workforce than we have right now. And what do you think those top skills will be for the future? What do you see as trending in some of the transferable profiles that you're looking at right now or you're noticing hiring managers talking about? Are there any skills that stand out to you as being high demand in the future? Not really. There's so many, right? Because there's there's different types of jobs. So if you wanted to be a program manager, you're going to need a certain skill set. Even if you didn't have a program manager title, there's probably program management that you've done, right? It, it isn't necessarily that there are skills that are standing out to me right now. What's standing out to me right now is explainability, translating those skills in a way that an employer can understand, oh, oh okay, it's the same thing, right? And doesn't bypass your resume because it doesn't have specific keywords on it. I think the there, there are so many skill sets that are needed and necessary, even though automation may displace folks, it is more around translating those skills into the, the, the right jobs. And I think that's the space that's going to need a lot of work. Incredible. I am watching the clock rapidly tick down. What excites you? So this is my last question, and then I'll have you uh, kind of close us out. But what excites you about the future? And I know my question says like 2023, 2024, but I like to think big. So what excites you about like the next five years, the next 10 years? What is getting you up in the morning? Obviously, you said skills-based hiring, but is there anything else that's keeping you really motivated right now? I'm going to focus on the year 2030, Lauren, and uh, because we set those, <laughs> the goals that we did, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that, the goals that I mentioned um, towards the year 2030, because there's so many nuances and amazingness in there. Even as I think about um, going for net zero for environmental sustainability, there's a focus of environmental justice there because climate change impacts marginalized communities more than anybody else. There's an intersection there. Um, when I think about AI ethics and I think about um, the social impact product, like that's an intersection of bias and barriers. And if we can get to the place to understand where the intersections of all of those are and to be able to remove or reduce the, the things that are getting in people's way to get jobs, that's exciting to me. Uh, if we're able to you know, take our workforce and change the shape of it everywhere we operate. That's exciting to me. So and that, that's part of the reason why we set really long-term audacious goals for the first time in the company's history, mind you. We've never publicly said, we're going to do this thing by this time. And so that's important because that means the entire company has to be around it, right? The entire company has to work on this space that will change so many people's lives 
And that's what gets that. That's what wakes me up in the morning. And I'm not a morning person, by the way. So it has to be something <laughs> that gets me going. And I think that that's it. Setting really audacious, ridiculous, amazing goals and working really hard to get there. I love it. What a perfect way to end the conversation. Thank you so much, LaFawn. How very quickly, how can the audience stay in touch with you, follow you, shout out your channels or whatever you'd like to promote? I, I would love for them to stay connected with you if possible. Sure. Well, I'm on the, uh, I don't really use the Twitter that much. That's what my dad calls it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm LaFawn at Twitter. On Twitter, uh, I am mostly on the gram. So I'm the LaFon, um, not the T-H-E-E, -E, but T-H-E LaFon on Instagram. Uh, I don't use Facebook, so don't, don't do that one. Um, but I'm also on LinkedIn um, and you can find me there as well. So I'm, I'm in a lot of the places, but I'm mostly engaged on Instagram. Amazing. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. I could talk to you for hours, but our time has come to an end. We really appreciate you, LaFon. Thank you so much. And Hunter, back over to you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, LaFon. Thank you, Lauren. Hope you have a great rest of your day.